issue uh, so let's get cracking early and um, this is an event between labor list of which i am editor i'm tom belger uh, an independent website covering all things labor which hopefully you know uh, and the joseph roundtree foundation uh, so my panel today, really pleased to say, is uh, Darren Baxter to my left, who is the Principal Policy Advisor uh, at the Joseph Roundtree Town Foundation. To uh, his, another chair for Vicky, yeah. To his left is going to be Vicky Spratt, um, but she's uh, been put on a last minute assignment. Uh, she's a top housing correspondent for the I. She should be joining us shortly. Uh, and to my right, we have uh, Tom Copley, who I think I'm right in saying is Dep Deputy Mayor of London for Housing. Uh, and then further to my right, uh, not politically, Matthew Pennycock, uh, Shadow Minister for Housing and... <laughs> Slander. Pennycock, whoops. Cook, cook. Matthew Pennycook, uh, Shadow Minister for Housing and Planning for Labour. Um, okay, so I was just going to say briefly, um, Labour's made a lot of positive noises on housing, uh, and uh, they want 70% of people to own their own homes, which is a pretty ambitious target. They want social housing to be the second largest tenure. Uh, they want right to buy sales to be replaced. Uh, they've said they will introduce a new mortgage guarantee scheme to help first time buyers. Uh, they promise to boost leaseholders' rights, which feels pretty overdue, uh, and a uh, private renters' charter with some quite wide ranging reforms, uh, and obviously planning reforms, got a lot of headlines uh, and much more. But I thought it'd be interesting to start maybe with um, what Labour's immediate focus should be in power. You know, what kind of things they could actually potentially do, either in the first hundred days or early on at least. Uh, and I know Darren has some uh, interesting thoughts on this and done some work on this. So let's start with Darren on that one. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not going to sort of start by saying how bad the housing crisis is, because like, clearly nobody would be in this room if they thought the housing market was doing great. So we know there's a big problem, but we also know that there's a this sort of current moment creates a load of challenges. So like rates of building is down relative to where it was even a few years ago. Um, housing associations, councils are struggling to build. Renters and mortgage holders are seeing their costs increase. So any government after an election next year is going to be inheriting a even trickier and escalating housing crisis. So I think there are sort of three things that an incoming government should focus on. So, so first is increasing the rate of house building, increasing housing supply. And that means building at all sorts of different levels, you know, like small sites delivered by small builders, kind of medium stuff, but also really big stuff. And I think um, it's really welcome to hear on the Today programme um, announcements from Labour about these, you know, big, big kind of publicly led new towns. And I think this is like a, a really ambitious opportunity for Labour. But the question that they'll need to answer, Matthew will need to answer if uh, Labour do win the next election, is how do you actually start to develop those? So yes, we need things like planning reform. Yes, we need things like land market reform to make it easier for councils to buy land. But we also need like more institutional capacity to actually drive those things forward. Private sector is not going to do it. Councils are underpowered, given that they have not been building for a long time. So we've called on setting up a publicly owned master developer to do that. So that is one thing. The second is, I also need to think about this sort of demand side of housing. You know, investment in housing has surged in the last couple of years, and that's why we've seen the private rented sector go, grow massively. So over the last two decades, we've seen the number of 16 to 34-year-olds who own their own home half over the same time the proportion of people that own multiple properties so who are landlords or who have spare um, second homes has doubled at the same time two sides of the same coin and that's because it's easy to become a landlord money's been cheap regulation has been poor um, and tax has been low and we need to change all those things to so regulate renting to make it more secure but see that as part of rebalancing demand in the system as well so changing some of the taxes around things and we can talk at length about what those should be and finally the housing crisis is worse for those who are on the sharpest end of it so housing costs have always been a driver of poverty but in when we look at the things we do as a foundation uh, sort of like our cost of living tracker which looks at the people on the lowest 40 percent of incomes and sees how they're faring with debt and borrowing this stuff that comes out of like sector partners like um, the Citizens Advice Bureau, we're seeing that you know, pretty much every measure is getting worse. And we've got some work on destitution coming out in a couple of weeks. And that will have really worrying figures about just the escalating crisis there. And the role of housing costs in that is just ever growing. And so a, a new government will absolutely have to grapple with those things first. I mean, one easy piece of low hanging fruit would be making sure that the housing support you get through universal credit, which is currently frozen despite rents rising massively, is um, reconnected. So the support you get to help you pay your rent if you're on a low income 
matches the actual cost of renting locally. So those are three ideas, but very interested in what the rest of the panel has to say as well. Thank you so much. Food for thought. Uh, Tom, any ideas for uh, your colleagues nationally on um, what Labour could potentially do? Oh, I suspect I've got a very long list, but I'll, I'll try and keep it uh, as brief as possible. Look, I think you know, housing is absolutely foundational. It's completely fundamental to people's lives and people's ability to lead a, a good life. Uh, and that's why I'm so delighted that uh, the Labour Party put it front and centre uh, of their conference uh, and why we've got such a huge turnout for a fringe specifically on, on housing. And, and, and the reason for that is, is I think that so much of what Labour is going to want to do um, in, in the next uh, term, should it win the next election, um, it, 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 housing is going to be fundamental to that and fixing the housing crisis is going to be fundamental to that. Whether it's economic growth, which could be really be supported both um, through the economic growth that's generated through investing uh, in construction and new jobs and things like that, uh, but also to the wider economic benefits of people, for example, living in healthier homes people taking fewer sick days, people uh, uh, not having so much to call on the NHS for. I think housing is so fundamental. So if we start cracking that in the first 100 days, uh, which I, I'm, I'm sure um, um, you know, things will kick off very soon, uh, that's going to be absolutely crucial to the rest of Labour's agenda. And in London, we are in a different place, both in terms of the scale of the housing crisis, but also some of the things that we've been doing to tackle it. In London, the mayor and the Greater London Authority performs the function that Homes England performs in the rest of the country. So we are the funding authority for affordable housing. It's helped us to plough a different furrow to the rest of the country in, in some respects. So what Darren was saying about councils um, you know, not having delivered council housing for a long time, in London, nearly every council is now delivering council housing. Some of them are at quite an impressive scale. And that's because of decisions that were made at City Hall in terms of how funding was directed and in terms of support being directed in terms of council staffing and resourcing and things like that. But also, of course, through the hard work and dedication and vision and political leadership within those boroughs. So I think that working with a government that, you know, frankly, is, is, um, uh, is a friendlier government, let's, uh, let, let's be honest, much friendlier government than the current government, then, we, can really, we can really turbocharge what we have been uh, uh, doing in terms of council housing, in terms of affordable housing more generally. And I think certainly with the first 100 days, we're going to get that fundamental reset to the relationship between government uh, and the mayor, really working uh, in partnership. And everything that the GLA does, um, uh, we do uh, in partnership. But I, I think there are huge opportunities uh, working constructively uh, with uh, a Labour government to really, really turbocharge what we've been doing in London. On the master developer point, the mayor uh, controls a lot of land in London, both through the GLA, through Transport for London, through some of the other functional uh, bodies. We're already developing that, that land out. I think there's a big role for the GLA to play as a master developer. We've got a commitment and are currently in the process of setting up a city hall developer, uh, and that's really going to take off uh, in the mayor's next term. The potential for all of this to come together, for us to be able to do even more uh, working uh, with a future Labour government, I think is huge, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear from Matthew both, I guess, what Labour already planned early on uh, and what you make of any of those ideas for the first 100 days or at least early days of Labour government. Early days, I think we say. We, don't, we, don't, we can't use 100 days. There will be stuff happening in the first 100 days, but it won't all happen within the first 100 days, and we're pretty uh, cautious about what we promise within that time period and more generally because in a genuine sense, while we want to have a, a bold, ambitious programme, we got to be very, very clear with the public that everything that we say that we're going to deliver, we can deliver, that it's costed, that it's achievable. And everything that's gone behind the announcements today and those announcements that will come um, in future days and months will be approached on that basis. I'd say a few things. I mean, first, it is absolutely amazing to see so many people here for a, a housing fringe. It is, it is, you know, it's really heartening to see uh, members to see, you know, partners who've come to the conference take an interest, and I'm really glad that it's front and centre. Keir's going to be talking later today about how we give Britain its future back. This is absolutely central to how we do that, um, both in terms of delivering on all the missions. We won't get economic growth unless we get house building going, unless we, uh, li uh, you know, deal with some of the constraints in the planning system, make it faster, more streamlined. We won't unlock opportunities for all. We won't deal with net zero or health outcomes, uh, for that matter, if we don't get this going. So it really is central to a number of the missions. Um, I'll just touch upon, uh, Darren said we won't touch upon the, the housing crisis, and uh, he absolutely makes the right point that most of you in this room will probably know firsthand um, how acute that crisis is. I, I describe it as an entrenched crisis, but an intensifying crisis, and I don't think it, it is 
um, hyperbole to say that in some parts of the country, including my own um, part of South East London, it has reached emergency levels. I mean, TA rates are at risk of tipping local authorities into real financial difficulties. And obviously, behind all the statistics, all the units are people. And, uh, you know, any elected politician at this conference will tell you, I have people at my advice surgeries week in, week out, in tears because they are stuck in overcrowded, unsuitable accommodation. So we're paying a huge price in terms of what we're doing to our population, particularly our uh, young people, particularly children stuck in TA. I think it's an absolutely shameful situation we're in. But that wider economic uh, picture as well, we're harming productivity, we're harming growth by constraining uh, what our towns and cities can do. And it is all going to get a lot worse. Uh, you know, the market conditions as they stand for various reasons, including um, one of my constituents, a, a mistrust and her impact <laughs> upon the economy um, is part of that. But it goes way beyond that. And I think it's about policy choices this government have made, which will actively exacerbate the crisis. You know, and we can, I could reel off any number of them. But the abolition of, of mandatory local housing targets is already feeding through into suppressed house building rates local plan coverage dropping, and all of this, I think, will give us a very, very difficult inheritance if we're elected at uh, the general election next year in terms of what we pick up. And what we do will really depend on where the government have got to. And I'll give you a couple of examples. We are absolutely committed to comprehensive reform of the private rented sector. The government's bill is a good starting point. If they don't deliver that bill, we've got to look to deliver that piece of legislation. We are absolutely committed to fundamental reform of the leasehold system. If the government don't enact the Law Commission's recommendations in full, we will have to pick up and finish that. So we're going to have a very busy agenda. But more widely, and building on some of the announcements we've already made, we have just got to boost supply and supply of all forms of housing. We've, for decades, not built enough housing in this country. We've got to address that, and in particular, We've got to build a lot more affordable and particularly genuinely affordable social rented homes as part of that mix. We've got a chronic shortage of them, and it really is at the heart of the housing crisis um, as we see it today. In terms of very early steps, I'll just say a few things. I think because of the situation we're going to inherit, we in a sense need a, a rescue package for the planning system. We've got to undo some of the damaging changes the government have done. We've got to restore mandatory local housing targets. We've got to restore the presumption in favor of sustainable development, five-year land supply. These things in and of themselves don't get supply up, but they are essential bedrock to, to other reforms. So we've got a bit of rescuing to do. We've got a bit of uh, reform to the local planning system to get things moving more quickly. Rachel touched on some issues yesterday about how on the energy net zero side we can get things moving more fast. We need more capacity in the system. We're taking steps to address that. But beyond that recovery system, we need to be bold and address the fact that we don't do large-scale housing development in this country well. The plot-by-plot -plot approach is not going to meet the scale of the crisis, and that's why I'm incredibly proud, and it has been a labour of love, I can tell you, over many, many months, um, the package that we've announced today. And I think anyone who says to you today that Keir or this changed Labour Party is being timid on any area of policy, just point them to a new generation of new towns. It is anything but timid. It's going to be very challenging to deliver. But it's the kind of bold uh, policy commitments I think we need to make to address the crisis. And that's just part of a package that's coming out today. Keir will no doubt touch on some of this. But a package to intensify development on brownfield land. How can we sweat more of the derelict, already used land in our city centres? Tom will have uh, very clear views on that. But do it in a way that creates good places, gets us a good amount of affordable housing, um, builds those places that people want to live. Strategic planning, the reintroduction of strategic planning at a sub-regional level. It is a real failure of the system that at the moment we've got no means for local councils to cooperate with each other to meet housing growth at scale, cross-boundary, in a sensible strategic way. And all of them, therefore, are dealing with lots and lots of speculative development on the fringes of their uh, uh, conurbations in a way that's, that's putting people's backs up. And understandably, and I kind of finish on this point, I always come back to this. I find this yimby nimby uh, debate quite reductive and not particularly helpful. In the sense that there will always be people who will oppose housing development of any kind anywhere near them. And we are very, very clear we're going to take those people on. But there's a much wider group that don't like development in their area because it's not high quality, it's not well designed, it's not good place, uh, places in which people to live, the infrastructure isn't there up front. And I think with all of this, and you can do it through new towns, if government is taking more direct responsibility for development outcomes and using some different tools, you can do much more, I think, to be creating good, sustainable places. And you will change the conversation, I hope, 
about development and what it means if it's coming to your area in a way that makes it less threatening for less people, not everyone, but for less people, and allows us uh, to sell that bargain. And that's what we need to do. There's a lot of stuff that comes behind that that needs to happen. But we are, as I say, um, uh, putting forward today, and it will be in the months ahead, this is not the final word, a bold and ambitious but pragmatic and we're confident uh, deliverable programme that will start to address, and it won't be an overnight thing, but will start to address um, the housing crisis uh, that we all know exists out there in the country. Thank you very much. Um, we talk a lot about, uh, we've heard Labour talk quite a lot about, you know, big picture housing stuff. Um, I think one interesting, important area to talk about, there was a report out this week, or maybe last week, uh, saying England's the worst place in the developed world uh, to find a home, and the number of renters here who are paying almost half their income in rent is more than four times higher than in Germany. And we've got more poor quality housing than the average EU country. I, I think it'd be interesting to talk about what Labour's offer is specifically for those 30% of people, even in an ideal world, uh, who aren't going to own their own home. Um, and, uh, and I guess talk about whether it goes far enough. Uh, Matthew, is there anything you'd be keen to say, particularly around that, around kind of um, ideas for supporting low-income households, probably not got much chance of, of getting on the housing ladder? Well, I, I, think there's a, I think there's a couple of parts to that. I'm, I'm sort of uh, unashamed housing and playing policy nerd, so I go back to the RUG report. Anyone remember the RUG report? That there's uh, it's still the basic principle of what's wrong. We've got the bottom third of people stuck in the private rented system who should be in an affordable uh, home to rent, uh, in many cases a social rented home. We've got a third at the top that if they had the proper support in place, if government were putting um, the packages in place, should be able over time to be able to be helped onto the housing ladder. And it's partly, I come back to the, the, the shortage of affordable homes, the chronic shortage of uh, genuine affordable social homes, as part of the reason why the private rented sector um, is so overheated in parts of the country. So we've got to deal with it. So I think there are a number of things we do. We've got to do renters reform. As I say, if the government don't do it, we will. And we've got to strengthen that renters reform bill as it is in Parliament. There's big loopholes in there. There are issues that are not addressed. For example, how do you deal with uh, unreasonable within-tenancy rent rises? If Once you abolish Section 21, economic evictions <coughs> and rent hikes are going to be the means that uh, you know, poor uh, rogue landlords look to to evict people. So we've got to strengthen that bill. We've got to pass that bill. But then we've got to have an offer for uh, home homeowners, first-time buyers, which we've got, mortgage guarantee uh, scheme, first dibs for, for first-time buyers on new developments. And then the big one for me is we've got to just boost the rates of affordable house building. Angela Rayner outlined uh, earlier in the week in opening the conference how we're going to look to strengthen the existing developer contribution system so that we're arming councils to better negotiate with developers to get the maximum amount of public gain, maximum amount of affordable housing and infrastructure out of a negotiation, and how they can hold those developers to it so that they honour the commitments that they can make. And then we've got to make better use of the grant funding that's already allocated. It is unbelievable, I don't know if this, people overlook this, that Michael Gove is handing back, reprofiling, was yeah, how yeah, it was put yeah, to us, yeah, yeah. almost £2 billion worth of affordable uh, homes uh, grant funding. The crisis is so acute, all of that should be going out the door, and we've got to look at the flexibilities and freedoms we can offer. And part of the package we've said today is, um, you may have missed it among many others, as part of the biggest devolution of powers uh, to mayoral combined authorities and combined authorities, we're going to devolve a lot of this grant funding mm -hmm. on brownfield regeneration funding and affordable homes programme to get a bit closer in many ways, and I know London would like to go further, uh, to the London model, which is trusting elected uh, mayors and officials in their areas to use their grant better over a longer period of time. They know where the homes need to be built, what homes need to be built in their own areas. So some of it is about devolving powers but it's I see it as I suppose part and parcel of the whole thing because as soon as you get into housing and planning you understand that it is a very complex system and every part of the system affects the other so we've got to have reform and change across the board to deal with some of these problems. I mean, some of this 1.9 billion pounds that Michael Go gave back and by the way Michael send us a check we'll spend it um, but it's housing infrastructure funding that has been sitting, we've been talking about for years and years and years, where stations could have been be under construction or have been built by now to support housing that can't come forward until those stations have been built. And this is money that keeps getting handed back um, and you know, discussions go nowhere. It, it, it is completely and utterly dysfunctional and that speaks to Matthew's, I think Matthew's devolution point. But the question was about renters and the private rented sector. Look, we ha have come in this country partly by accident, partly by design, to be far, far too reliant on buy-to-let landlords. You know, 
not, not, to, not to disparage you know, the, entirely all landlords, but you know, people who are not set up um, to be housing the people, a lot of the people that are being housed, people who traditionally would have been living in low-cost rented social housing. And we're, we've been asking the sector essentially to take on the temporary accommodation problem. By the way, one in 23 London children, one child in every average London classroom is now living in temporary accommodation. Many in the private rented sector uh, uh, being supported uh, by housing benefit at a much higher level than they would be in the social rent sector. By the way, sometimes councils renting back homes they were forced to sell under right to buy. I mean, it's an absolutely ludicrous system. And now that interest rates are going up, that system is complete. It was never, it was never working particularly well, but it's now completely falling apart. Uh, every, and, and, and at the time, when every single light on the housing dashboard is flashing red. It is a total crisis. So uh, what do we need for renters? Matthew's already talked about renters' reform bill. Great to hear that this, does, this government doesn't get it through. Uh, the next Labour government will, and that it will be strengthened. That's absolutely vital. The mayor is also calling for rent control, uh, the power to, be, for, to introduce rent controls to be devolved to City Hall, uh, and then we would set up a commission to design a system that will work for London. I think that's eminently sensible. It's not a silver bullet. It's absolutely not a silver bullet. I don't believe in silver bullets, and rent control certainly isn't. It's got to be in the context of a, of a, of a, a, a very large-scale home-building programme, which brings us on to the next thing, which is social home building. That is going to be absolutely crucial. Uh, we've got to get that level up. Uh, we need to get more grant in. You, you can't build subsidised housing without, without subsidies, so we have to do that. My, my, my um, uh, sort of case to the government is always is invest to save. I know you've got to spend now and the savings come later, but the savings will come. They'll come in lower housing benefit, lower cost of the NHS, uh, and the boost that you'll get to the economy as well. The, the final thing, uh, uh, and just on that, by the way, on social home building, um, we have had some success in London when Sadiq Khan, and this again speaks to devolution, when Sadiq Khan came to power, Boris Johnson left just three City Hall funded social rent homes in the pipeline. We started more than 1,500 social rent homes, uh, re homes at social rent levels last year, uh, and we want to do even more. The final point I'll just make uh, is a welfare one, and that's around LHA rates. We do need uh, 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 to have an uplift in LHA uh, rates because you know, currently only t less than 2% the private rented housing stock is affordable uh, and that's just not not sustainable but even if you will increase LHA rates in the long term if you build social rented housing as well we can start to get that housing benefit build out really really interesting thoughts Darren um, I think I'll be brief because I actually just agree with a lot of what Dan just said but I think um, yeah, I mean, the situation people face at the moment, I think, is, is one of trying to stay put because we, there's a massive divergence between sort of asking rents are growing really, really significantly um, and much faster than sort of in tenancy rents. So you've got a lot of people really trying to stay put in the houses, no matter what the quality of that house is. It might be actually a bit rubbish and the landlord's not doing repairs, but they know if they move, they could be facing, you know, a third increase in what they're paying every month. But they have no real choice whether they get to stay put because the landlord can serve section, uh, section 21 eviction and get rid of them with a few months' notice at the drop of a hat. So the problem really is the blend of a, a security and an affordability one. So yes, we need like, renters reform really quickly. It, on that list of things that need tightening up um, and, and need reforming, one of them is that um, the biggest reason that landlords end tenancies and have done for a long time, and this is sort of seeming potentially increasing now, is either to sell it or to move back into it themselves. And that is the biggest reason that um, and tenancies end in homelessness, you know, people presenting themselves to council, council's homeless. There is no, there's no sort of restriction on that in the current proposed, uh, proposed renters reform. Um, beyond a kind of uh, an initial six month period that should be much longer you know nearer to like two three years or something if you really want to meaningfully protect people um and yeah the, the, the other point is one of long term we need more social housing we, we didn't alternate the amount of uh, the proportion of people renting over the last few decades hasn't changed that much the big thing that has changed is the proportion that are renting privately over socially we need alternate <laughs> models which are more democratically controlled more more stable um, more secure um, but in the short term yeah there is a question of subsidy we subsidize house, housing costs either by providing a cheaper rent by providing a cash transfer so you can pay your rent or by capping rents that private landlords can charge any government has an option of which of those they go for but not have, not choosing an adequate adequate one of those um, isn't really going to work 
Interesting, fantastic. Um, I thought next uh, be interesting to talk about what some of the barriers are for labour in this area. 